Good morning. Good morning, everybody. So, um, back in 1999, <clears throat> there was a big story in Chicago um, about how the baby Jesus figure had been stolen from the nativity scene in Daly Plaza. So I thought I'd show you a picture of uh, Daly Plaza and what it looks like. That's the nativity scene. And you can see, I've got another photo. You can see it's quite a busy place, this Daly Plaza in Chicago, if you've ever been. And, <clears throat> and then we've got one more picture close up of the nativity scene. So somebody stole the baby. It was eventually recovered. Somebody, got, somebody tipped off the police and they found baby Jesus at um, a bus station took the baby back, and this time they're like, you know what, we are securing baby Jesus better. So they decided to secure him with a cord and a bolt and a padlock to the manger. He is not getting out, all right? But in 2004, a young college student managed to slip Jesus out from underneath the wires and get the baby Jesus and make a run for it. Two days later, he was caught. He was fined with some sort of misdemeanor. And this time they're like, we need stronger security measures, stricter to keep the baby Jesus in the manger. So what they now have what's known as a God squad, true story. And they are to secure and protect the baby Jesus from being stolen. All right. They keep, they're pretty tight lipped about their security measures. But these guys are there to make sure Jesus never leaves the manger again. True story. You know, during this time, um, it's, it's, it's normal and it's natural for us to think of Jesus, baby Jesus in the manger, you know, sweet and mild and gentle and, you know, silent night, no crying he makes. You know, it's, it's natural. It's this time of year. It's appropriate. But I think we have to be mindful not to bolt our perception of Jesus down to the manger. See, the world, I think, looks at Jesus the same way they look at him like a baby. I think they see him as this sweet and passive and mild and, you know, light-skinned with a twinkle in his eye, you know. That's who they think of when they think of Jesus, you know. <clears throat> but most rarely ever think of Jesus as combative or aggressive, or, you know, forget socially impolite. But he was. In many occasions, he was. So it's important when we look at Jesus to find out who he is, who he was, what he represented. And in order to do this, we have to let Jesus out of the manger. And we're going to have to stop stealing Jesus. And that is the title of my sermon today. It is Stealing Jesus. If you remember the night, um, going back, the night Jesus was born, you know, the shepherds were in the fields, and then suddenly a host of angels appears in the sky, and they're shouting, and they're declaring the birth of Jesus, and they say, you know, glory to God in the highest, and, and peace on earth to men. And, and you know, we see this on, on, on Christmas cards all over the place now. This is what, what is on the little Christmas cards. You see the shepherds and you see peace on earth, peace on earth. And, and many thought that Jesus was coming to establish peace, meaning like there was going to be no more wars, no more conflict. He was going to rule as the king. He was going to take over. He was going to put to, you know, put under his feet the Roman Empire. Uh, and many still think that. They thought, oh, Jesus was, the, the, a lot of the Jewish people are waiting because they said, no, he's going to come and establish peace. He's going to come and make our lives more, more comfortable, more secure, you know, so, so we can feel uh, safe when Jesus is the king. That's what people thought he was coming to do. But that's not entirely accurate, is it? We know from Scripture that Jesus is our Prince of Peace. So he did come to establish peace, but not necessarily in the way people think. For instance, what do we do with this scripture? I'm going to put up Matthew chapter 10 and verse 34 for you. And it says, Jesus says this, Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wait, what? What happened to our Prince of Peace? What happened to goodwill toward men? What, what, this does not fit with our view of Jesus in the manger. Jesus with the sword? 
No, he's the sweet, the meek, the mild, the, ba the mild baby, right? There's no sword in that picture. Of course, Jesus is not meaning this literally. He didn't come to literally wield a sword. We know that. <clears throat> he was not for violence at all. <clears throat> what he's talking about here is he's saying that his mission is going to cause conflict. The mission he was coming, the words he was going to speak was going to cause conflict with those who do not believe him. It was going to cause division. It was going to bring division between people. People were going to be upset. It was going to be as if he was coming with a sword. So what's happening earlier in this chapter, <clears throat> the same chapter, Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is sending out his 12 disciples. He's got his disciples in front of him. Now, if you don't know this, if you're a believer in Jesus, you are a disciple. That's what the Bible says, okay? So you're a disciple. So let's put ourselves in the story now. Here's Jesus, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 7. And he is sending out his disciples. Can you, Brian, can you open this for me? You've sealed that nice and tight for me. Thanks. <laughs> he is sending, thank you. He is sending out his disciples with this announcement. All right, here you are. You're the disciple. Listen. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cure those with leprosy. Cast out the demons. Give as freely as you have given. Sorry, give as freely as you have received. Thanks. Yeah, you're, there you go. Thanks for helping, Dad. Roles are reversed. So... So imagine, like, you're a disciple, right? This is his commission to you guys. This is his commission to us still to this day, folks. But honestly, if we look at those, how many are we guilty of? How many can you say, oh, no, I'm telling them about the kingdom. I'm healing the sick. I'm raising the dead. Okay, we don't have many people with leprosy, but we can change that. Cure those with COVID. Just saying. It's not nearly as lethal as leprosy was. So what's the big deal? It's right in the scripture, right? Tell them, come, bring your COVID. We'll cure, we'll cure it. Come on, that's what Jesus said we're supposed to do, right? Not lock the doors and keep them out. Just saying. That wasn't in my sermon. Going to keep going. So you're a disciple. This is a great commission. Jesus is commissioning you. are like, oh, this is good. Cost out demons, raise the dead. I'm loving this. Then Jesus follows it up with, I'm sending them out like sheep among wolves. I'm sorry, what now? Who's the wolves? Where are the wolves? We're the, we're the sheep? You're sending us to the wolves? This doesn't sound so good, Jesus. Taking a turn here, not liking it. And then he goes on to say, verse 22, let's put up verse 22. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Jesus, what about the, what, a, what happened to the peace on earth? Peace to goodwill to men? Hated for my name's sake. Peace, peace on earth. Can we go back to the peace on earth, goodwill? Hated for my name's sake. See, we should try to do that in the altar call next time. How many people would love to give their life to the Lord, make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, and you're going to be hated by all for his name's sake? Yeah, you know? Might change the altar call some, huh? Because we're always like, come on in. It's going to be so nice and comfortable and safe and secure. Not true. Not true. Not according to Jesus. Why is he saying this? Yes, we know Jesus is, is our peace. And we know to know him is to know peace. But he is telling them this because he is preparing them for conflict. He's preparing them for challenges. He's preparing them for persecution. He's like, look, you're going to go out and you're going to do all these awesome things. You're going to be telling people about Jesus. You're going to watch people get healed. You're going to watch people get delivered. And guess what? You're going you're to encounter challenges. You're going to encounter conflict. You're going to encounter persecution. There's a good chance you might end up in jail for sharing Jesus. You know, it would be nice if everybody loved Jesus and loved what he had to say. Just like it would be equally nice if the world loved the church. But they don't. And what Jesus is basically saying here is that if a Christian or a church has the approval of the world, 
it is a sign that they are not preaching the truth or Christ. Yep, I'm going to say that again. It is a sure sign they're not standing for the truth or for Christ if you have the approval of the world. How many Christians do you know? How many churches do you see right now trying to please everybody? Let's be inclusive, people. Let's include everybody. Let's not be politically incorrect right now. You know, let's, 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 let's get everybody in. You know, this is, the way, this is the way it should be. We should be including everybody, trying to fit in with society because things have changed. Mm. Not according to Jesus. Jesus is saying that if you truly preach him and what the Bible says, you should be expected to be hated. You should expect persecution. You should expect them to be threatening you to be put in jail. And honestly, we're not far from it here in California. See, the problem is this doesn't go along. What Jesus is saying doesn't go along with the world's idea or view of Jesus. Because what they've done is they've conformed Jesus to their beliefs instead of allowing the word of God to transform them. They look at Jesus and the word and they're like, yeah, I think we need to make some changes here to better fit in politically what's going on, to see what society is happening. We need to change Jesus and the word. Oh, my friend, I'm sorry, that is wrong. That is not what God says. We have to let the word of God conform us. No matter how much we think, wow, that doesn't sit quite right with me. Take it to the Lord. Ask the Holy Spirit to explain to you why. Let him reveal the truth to you. You know, here in California, we are blessed, aren't we, with the governor who would love to arrest you if he could for coming to church. He would love to fine you, wait for it, if you open your mouth and sing praises to the Lord God Almighty. And I know you're sitting here, so I know your spiritual eyes are open, and I know many of us, many watching would agree with this, but there's many people's spiritual eyes who are not open to see what's going on. Beyond them trying to steal your religious freedom, folks, it can only be a false God that would set himself up against Almighty God and utter the words, don't worship. How dare he? I'm taken back in the Old Testament to the three Hebrew boys and they built the altar and they said, bow and worship or you face the fire. And they said, I don't care, I'll face the fire. I'm not, I'm not bowing and worshiping that. In California, it's stop worshiping or we'll fine you $5,000. Well, it looks like I'm going to court. <laughs> I need an attorney. Because I'm not shutting my mouth. You know what I do? I make a habit of, because when I'm in the grocery store, sometimes when I go shopping now with the mask on, I start singing Christian worship songs through my mask in the store, people. Oh, yeah. Come on, Jesus. Forget not singing in the church. I'm going to sing these praises everywhere. Come on. We have to open our eyes, see the people around us are fearing man, what man can do. Instead of the fear of the Lord, if you truly knew who God was and the fear of the Lord, you'd be like, I actually don't care what you think you can do. You could kill my body. I'll be with Jesus in a second, but I'm not going to shut up. You must be joking. Mm-mm. Get me fired up today. But I also want to encourage you, for those sitting here and for those watching, because I know many of you are speaking up. Many of you are fulfilling this great commission that Jesus has sent us on. And guess what? You're losing friends. You're alienating your family. You've had family members turn their back on you because of what you've chosen to say, what you've chosen to post, what you've chosen to come to church. People are like, how dare you? Don't you know what you're doing? And you choose to stand for Jesus. I want to tell you something. God is proud of you. The Heavenly Father is smiling like you wouldn't believe from ear to ear. He is so proud of you. Because guess what? He chose you to be born now. I know I say this a lot because I've never felt it so strongly in my soul as I felt it this last year. We were chosen for now. Because guess what? He looked at you and he was like, that person, that girl, that guy, 
they'll stand for me when nobody else will. That person, they'll speak up for me when everybody else will say, shh, you'll lose all your friends. That's why I'm choosing them to be born now. Whatever your occupation, whatever you do, whatever your desire is, God's put it there because he needs you now in that place, wherever you are, he needs you. Open your eyes, folks. He needs you now, amen? The other thing that the world has stolen from Jesus is his personality. You know, Jesus has a pretty awesome personality. And if, you've, if you don't know that, go read the Gospels and read it from a point of view of a personality. You see so many different interesting stories there. And you know, I, I don't know about you, but I love to laugh. Anybody else just love laughing, right? That makes me know that God's got a sense of humor. He does, because if we are made in his image and we like to laugh, he likes to laugh. And he's actually done so many things around us to make us to have a little giggle, if you hadn't noticed. I'm going to point a few things out to you. How many of you have ever seen a, uh, an ostrich? How many of you have ever seen an ostrich up close? Come on now. What, ab what about a hippopotamus? That's not the funny part. The funny part is his tail, people. What? What is that? Like, is there any good coming out of that? Like, God's, God's like, let's give him this tail. Won't be able to do a thing with it, but let's give it to him. What about the Hawaiian happy spider? Folks, that is not superimposed. That is not drawn on. That is the happy spider. We have another one. I've got two just to prove it to you. Okay. God did that before there were emojis. Okay? God's up in heaven going, I'm going to show them I did it first. He does the happy smiley face on the spider. Come on! This is the God we serve. You know, sometimes you love someone because of their personality. If you've got that friend that, like, literally makes you laugh so hard you cry, you know, that friend, you just love being around them because you laugh so hard you get a headache, you know, kind of thing. And, and then there's that, that relative that you've got that just tells the best stories. They're so animated and they have the best stories. Or if you're looking for an adventure, you're like, oh, I want to do something fun. I want to do something crazy. I want to go. You know exactly who to call, right? Because they've got these unique personality traits that draw you to them and make you love them. Jesus is no different. He has so many different personality traits, but what the world has done is they've stripped him of it so that you have no affinity towards him. I, I was trying to get my point across, and so I went online and I thought, well, let me see what people draw or create when they think of Jesus. So let's find some artwork that people have created of how they imagine Jesus to look. So this is artwork number one of Jesus. Seriously? What the? What the weirdness happened? I don't even know what to do with that picture. I was like, what is that? It's weak and, and pale and kind of weird, kind of scary, not really like feeling any. <sighs> okay. We got another one. Mm. What words come to mind when you see this? Passive, pushover, weak, mild, void of any kind of personality. Folks, Jesus was the most radical person who ever walked the face of the earth. He was playful and funny and kind and compassionate and angry and fierce when he needed to be. And the man was full of courage. He was nothing what they show. But why have people gotten so far away from the real Jesus? Why have they gotten so far away from who he really is to paintings like you just saw? Because of religion. Religion. Religion gets in the way of relationship. God never wanted some man-made religion. He wanted a relationship with us and he sent his son 
so you could experience God in person and see his personality and fall in love with this man. That's why thousands of people followed him, not just for the miracles, because of who he was, his personality. But see, with religion comes tradition. And you know, Christmas time, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's my favorite time of the year. And with it, we have a lot of awesome traditions. I'm sure you have like, you know, how you like to decorate your house, how you like to decorate your tree. You know, you have all these different things that are important to you. And maybe who comes over Christmas Eve? Where do you go Christmas Day? And, and of course, we love all of this. I'm not saying it's bad. Uh, I'm just saying that when it comes to religion, there tends to, a lot of traditions tend to seep in. Sometimes it's the way you've done it since you were a child. This is how we did it. We went to church. This is where we went. This is the, how we did it. Or this is how I do my devotional every day, like this, like this, like this. And some things become a religion. They become a ritual in your life. So why is that important? Well, let's see what Jesus says about that. We'll go to Mark chapter 7 and verse 13. And Jesus says, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. What he is saying is, these traditions you have that you get stuck in, these ways of doing things, they make the word of God of no power in your life. You're like, what? How does that happen? Well, because when you get stuck in this tradition, you get stuck in the, the, the tradition of what you're doing. You're losing the relationship you have with God. The word of God now becomes dull, becomes of no value, becomes of no power in your life. See, you're missing the real thing because you're stuck in the tradition. Religion is to people what kryptonite was to Superman. What did kryptonite do to Superman? Weakened him, stripped him of his power. What religion will do to you is it'll strip you of the power of God. It'll give you that Jesus that you saw of that painting. That is not the real Jesus. That's what religion and rituals will do. When you get stuck in, oh, this is the way I've got to do it. I come here, I do this, I do this, I go through the motions. You're going through the motions, you're checking the boxes, you've lost your relationship with the Almighty God. Jesus wants a relationship with you. He wants you to walk in the power of his word. He wants you to know him like father, like friend, like the best adventure you've ever been on your life. That's who Jesus is. He's created you with adventures, that spirit, because he loves it too. He wants to go there with you as well. He wants to go do all the fun stuff as well. He's created you with all this because he wants a relationship. And what might be keeping you from truly having a relationship with him and truly understanding God is because maybe your relationship with him is, is with a cardboard cutout. It's not the real thing. And you might be like, well, how do I, how do I find out? How do I know where I'm at with my relationship? Maybe if my rituals have gotten in the way. Well, examine your heart. Take some time and ask the Holy Spirit and examine your heart. And truly look in your heart and say, well, what kind of personality do I think Jesus really has? Yes, Cindy said all these things, but if I look at my own life, what personality do I think Jesus really has? Am I exhibiting that in my life? Am I showing that in my life? Am I fearful of him? Am I doing things out of the fear, too much fear of the Lord, and, and therefore, you know, I'm almost, I'm almost afraid of him? Because I'm in so much fear, I've surrounded myself with all these rules and regulations and self-implemented laws on myself so that I don't mess up, I do everything that I'm supposed to do, check off all the boxes so I don't make him angry? Or do you think that he's weak and passive? If you're honest with yourself, maybe your vision of him did look like those paintings. And you're wondering why you're not seeing the miracle in your life. Because you actually don't trust him. I wouldn't trust that painting. If I walked in and saw that painting in a church, I think I would turn around and walk right out. 
There's a reason we don't have a crucifix hanging up here with Jesus hanging on the crucifix. Because guess what? He's not there. He's up in heaven at the seat of the right hand of God. Yes, it's important in your prayer time to picture Jesus, what he suffered for you, so it invokes that gratefulness. But always make sure you raise him from the dead and put him up in heaven where he is. Because that shows weakness. If you think of, oh, that's where he's stuck on the cross. No, he's not. It showed the greatest courage there ever was. But he has risen from that place. In order to receive from Jesus, you need to fully understand who he is. You want to see that miracle in your life? You want to see that relationship restored? You want to see your kid come off drugs? You need to understand who Jesus is. You need to enlarge your understanding of who Jesus is and his authority. And your faith will rise with it. In closing, I want to read you something. This is not going to be up on the screen because I want to do something a little different. This is going to be from uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. What's happened is John, the apostle, has been caught up to heaven. And he is seeing Jesus. And he's trying his best in his words to describe him. What I want you to do for me is I want you to close your eyes. I don't want you to do anything. Don't write down any notes. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to listen to my voice. And I want you to use your imagination. And in your mind's eye, I want you to picture what I'm describing. So picture that you're standing in heaven as he begins to speak. When I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands. And walking among the lampstands, I saw someone like the Son of Man, wearing a full-length robe with a golden sash over his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, white as glistening snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were glowing like polished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like the roar of mighty ocean waves. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was shining like the brightness of the blinding sun. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet as good as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, and I heard his reassuring voice saying, Don't yield to fear. I am the beginning, and I am the end, the living one. I died, but now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. You may open your eyes. That is the God we serve. That is the Jesus we love and honor, and you need to expand that you need to be looking into jesus's personality you need to change the the religious way that you've been looking at him stop looking at him yes we appreciate him at the baby in the manger but he's not meek he's not mild you have to see jesus for who he really is jesus is the perfect manifestation of god he is the very substance and the embodiment of the creator he is the Word made flesh. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the mediator between man and God. He is the anointed one. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is our healer. He is our forgiver. He is the wisdom and the power of God. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And God has made him the head of all things, and every knee and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. By his name, every knee shall bow, because Jesus Christ is Lord. That's who you serve, folks. That's who's on the throne. Sometimes we have to dethrone some things and put God back on the throne in our lives. See, even when I was preparing this message, there were so many little things the Holy Spirit was talking to me about. And that is, 
It's, it's as if sometimes we give, oh, God, we love you, we serve you, here you go. But this part of my life over here, no, I, I'm good with. I, I, I'm, I'm fine managing this. We're good. I've got this under control. And God is saying, no, 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 that's not the way it works. I want all of you. I want all of you. That means total surrender to him in every single area. That scares people because they're like, I don't know what he's going to do with it. What's he going to do? Trust me, whatever he's going to do is so far more amazing than you could possibly imagine. And whatever you think you're holding on to so tight, no, it's my freedom. Nobody's going to tell me how to live my life. Guess what? You're going to miss out on the things God's got for you because he has planned amazing things for you to do. God is not that passive, weak person. He's the one who's created you with all the desires, all the influence he's given you, and he wants you to succeed in every single area of your life, but he wants you to touch those around you and impact those around you. That's, who he's called you to, that's what he's called you to do. But it, it takes complete surrender. It doesn't just mean, oh, yes, Lord God, I don't, want to not, I don't want to miss out on hell, so I will say the prayer. No, he's like, expect persecution. Expect challenge. Expect conflict. If we go in it with that outlook like, hey, all right, God, I'm, I'm expecting conflict for your name. I'm expecting it. I'm okay with it. When those people leave, God, that hurts, but I know I'm, I'm on the right side of things. Spending time with God and making sure you're on the right side. Making sure you're on God's side of things. Whatever it is in your life, take it to the Lord and say, God, I want, I want you in every area of my life. Put him on the throne in your life in every area.